أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأفضل الصلاة وأتم التسليم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ورضي الله تعالى عن سادة التابعين وعلماء العاملين وأئمة العرب المجتهدين ومقالديهم إلى يوم الدين أما بعد السلام عليكم Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah. Wa alaikum for the late start. I should know not to uh, try to do something right around the 8 o'clock time because you know that's when I do my work. Yeah. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Got some people still coming on, inshallah. Bear with me because I'm still recovering from a small minor sickness. I had a cold or a flu or something. So I feel kind of windy. Alhamdulillah. Assalamu alaikum to everybody that's on FB Facebook Live. Share the video. Make sure I made it public. Let the people know that we're here. I believe this is an important topic. No, it's not public. Let me make it public. Okay, now it's public. You can share it. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Imam Malik. Alhamdulillah. As we get into it, you're going to see that this is one of those uh, sensitive topics. I, I kind of expect that maybe some more people will be added to the list of people who don't like me anymore <laughs> after tonight. <laughs> the list. Huh? The list. It's shot. I'm doing that. Share the video. Please share the video. Let people know we're here. Uh, we had classes on Wednesdays a, f a few months ago. The last time I went overseas, uh, my brother Hassan Ali took, took him over. And when I came back, I kind of like dropped the ball. So I'm trying to pick it back up. We're going to continue where we left off. We were actually going through Usulu Wilaya. This is that same class. We just diverging for tonight, inshallah. Alhamdulillah. So our discussion today is called is on the subject of Tatiya. Tatiya, contrary to what many of us have experienced, if we've experienced it is when a Muslim pretends to be non-Muslim. Uh, but the title that we have here is its proper meaning, takia, which is dissimulation, pretending to be something you're not. Its proper meaning, proper usage, its perversion and weaponization against Ahlul Sunnah wal Jamaah. Can any everybody online hear me good? Somebody say something, let me know, inshallah. Well, the title that we have here is that's good. Alhamdulillah. And you will see closer to the end. 
about some of the events or some of the things that have taken place to which motivated today's talk, inshallah. As we said, uh, Takiya, as understood from the perspective of Aksma Sunnah wal Jama'at, is the act of pretending to be a non Muslim, a Kafir, while internally still holding on to the beliefs and tenets of Islam. If a Muslim is being forced to abandon his, abandon his or her religion, he or she is allowed to pretend to apostate from Islam in order to save their life. In other words, taqiyya is an option if one is being forced and death is imminent. Taqiyya is not an option to be used just to make life more convenient or hassle-free. Like some people pretend to be uh, non-Muslim just so people won't look at them funny. <laughs> The key is uh, not to be used like that. What does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say in his book? Allah says in Surah Namu. 16? Namu? Or Nahu? What's that? Surah Nahu. Number 16. <coughs> Man kafara billahi min ba'di imanihi illa Man ukriha wa kalbahu mutma'innu bil iman. Walakin man sharaha bil kufri sadran fa'alayhim gadabun min Allahi wa lahum adabun adim. Allah says, Whoever rejects his faith in Allah after having believed in Him, not the one who is compelled under duress by his heart is at peace with faith, but the one who has laid his breast wide open for disbelief upon such a people is the wrath of Allah and for them is a heavy punishment. And this, as we said in Surah, Nahl, Surah number 16, verse number 106. Now, the Sabah al-Nazul, the reason why this verse was revealed has to do with, can anyone guess? I give you a hint. Someone we know from amongst the early community who was forced to apostate. I can't think of his name, but I know he's the son of two martyrs. Give it, give it two martyrs. <laughs> You're right. I'm the lad. And when we get into the discussion, you can see that this story in the Sarah, it, it you see in this beautiful story, it deals with the two two options you have when you're being forced to abandon your deen. Uh, you're talking about Ammar bin Yasser and his mother Sumeya bin Kayat, who was the first martyr, and his father, his father Yasser, who was the second martyr. Uh, as you know. Uh, Sumeya, they took them out and tried to get them to apostate and return back to idol worship. And Sumeya, and I think it's important for us as well as this discussion that Sumeya is uh, was a black woman. If you know, you've seen the movie, the message that back in the day it was almost like you wasn't Muslim if you ain't seen that. Like, what, you ain't seen the message? You Muslim up. <laughs> right? Uh, the message, Sumeya is depicted as, you know, very pale, very light skinned. And, uh, but contrary to that, the, the 30 part series on the life of Umar, you know, she is betrayed, portrayed accurately. She's very dark skinned. That's how she's described. And our books as being very dark skinned. So, uh, and I always refer to that series because, number one, it's, it's in Arabic and you can find, it's easy to watch, it's on YouTube. You can find it in many languages, including English. When I say many languages, the subtitles, the English subtitles. And if you're, like if you know 
the part that you're watching it's almost like you're watching hadith being acted out like the words are literally like when you listen or watch a dialogue the dialogue literally happened that way the way it's recorded in the Sira or the hadith or whatever they're talking about and it seems like they tried to bet their best to depict the Sahaba and everyone who was portrayed in there, you know, accurately. There's some that's off, but it's way better than the message. So, you know, alhamdulillah. So, Sumeya was the first martyr. Who killed him? <laughs> uh, Abu Jahl killed her according to some narrations he you know took a spear and stabbed her in her private part and killed her while she was stretched out on the ground Ammar <laughs> Malik said, I'm going to be Hisham. <laughs> yes, alhamdulillah, that's Abu Jahl, for those who don't know. Abu Jahl, it was his nickname given to him by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Because as he said, his name is Amr. And it's, a beautiful, it's beautiful because when you look at his name in Arabic, minus the vowels, it's just like Umar. Right? It's the exact same letters. I ain't mean Ra. Right? And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam uh, prayed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bring Izza to Islam by whoever's the most beloved to him amongst the Amarain or the two Umars. And we know Allah answered that dua in favor of Umar bin al Khattab. So his name was Amr bin Hisham, but he was known as Abu Hakam, the possessor of wisdom. And the dude was a sharp dude. I mean, if you think of, but he uses. His wisdom for sharp evil, <laughs> right? Like it was his idea, the intricate plot to actually assassinate the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And you know you deep when Shaitan, the devil himself, comes and joins the Magnus, you know, in the person of a of uh, in, in the guise of a person who they refer to as the Sheikh of the Negs. Interestingly enough, ding ding ding, <laughs> message right, <laughs> right, the Sheikh of the Negs, and he puts the stamp of approval on Abu Jahl's plan to get different, get young men from each clan of the creation. They all kill the Prophet so long as them at the same time, so the blood won't be on any one of their hands, and you know, it'll be on everybody's hands and. They're not going to retaliate against everybody else. So, you know, they're going to be forced to ask for blood money and we'll pay, you know. So, uh, that's Abu Jah, right? Abu Jah killed, killed Sumeya. Uh, Ammar saw this. Ammar, excuse me. Ammar saw, saw this with his own eyes. He witnessed his mother get killed for, for you know, holding on to the dean. And... He witnessed his father get killed right in front of him for holding on to the dean. And when it got to him, he said whatever they wanted to hear and they let him go. And so the word got out that Amar apostated. They tortured him and he, they broke him and he apostated. The Prophet Sallallahu says, never. Amar is filled with Iman from his head to his toes. Faith is intermixed with his flesh and blood. Nah, I can't like I can't believe this. Ammar didn't apostate. Then Ammar himself went to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam crying. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam wiped his tears with his own hands and he said, If they return to you, let them hear again whatever you told them. And so then Allah revealed the portion of the verse, the exception, where Allah says, "Illa man ukriha wa qalbuhu mutma'inun bil iman," not the one who is compelled under duress while his heart is at peace with iman, faith. So in this verse, Allah is describing the type of person who apostates from Islam and talks about his punishment and. And in that verse is an exception. And that exception was revealed for Ammar bin Yasser. 
Allah also says, لَيَتَّكِذِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ الْكَافِرِينَ عَوْلِيَاءَ مِنْ دُونِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَمَنْ يَفْعَلْ ذَلِكَ فَلَيْسَ مِنَ اللَّهِ فِي شَيْءٍ إِلَّا أَنْ تَتَّقُوا مِنْهُمْ تُقَاتًا وَيُهَذِّرُكُمُ اللَّهُ نَفْسَهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ الْمَصِيرِ The believers must not take disbelievers as protecting friends instead of the believers. And whoever does that has no relation with Allah whatsoever unless you do so as a protective measure. To save yourself from them. Allah warns you of himself. For unto Allah is the return. And that's Surah Al-Imran. Verse number 28. Surah number 3 verse number 28. So that's another verse from the Quran. Making reference to Taqiyya. Pretending to be a non-Muslim. Or pretending to apostate. When you fear. That your life is. In jeopardy. Imam Bukhari in his Sahih, while commenting on the, the verse we just mentioned, quotes uh, Imam Hassan al Basri. Anybody knows who Imam Hassan al Basri is? Yes, yeah, no. Names familiar. Hmm? Names familiar. <laughs> He's a tabby. Alhamdulillah. What's tabby? First generation. Or after the Sahaba. Yeah, second generation. <clears throat> when, you, when we get to the end, and we you see why we even talking about this topic, I'm trying to keep it real basic and real simple. I, I think it's real important, inshallah. So, uh, Hassan al-Basri is a very famous, well-known tabby. Second generation Muslim. In the second gen from the second generation of Muslims, who did he learn from? Sahaba, Ali, both correct. Sahaba, Ali. May Allah ennoble his face and uh, be pleased with him. Uh, very famous student of Ali. And a lot of times you have to be careful because if you don't know the context or if you don't know Who's, who, who's being spoken about, sometimes a hadith or a narration will say Al-Hasan. And you may think it's Al-Hasan ibn Ali, and, you, and, it, and it could be referring to uh, Al-Hasan al-Basri, who is about to quote from now. In any case, uh, Al-Hasan al-Basri, he said, in, co in commenting on this verse that we just mentioned, At-Taqiyya ila yawm al qiyamah meaning uh, At-Taqiyya, will remain into the day of resurrection. In Fatul Bari, who knows what Fatul Bari is? It's a of Fatul Bari is a commentary on Sahih Bukhari. So we just mentioned this verse from the Quran, Surah Ali Imran, ayat number 28, which is mentioned in Sahih Bukhari. And we quoted Hassan al-Basri, who Imam Bukhari quoted, in commenting on this hadith. Now, in the commentary of Sayyid Bukhari, the, the author quotes Ibn Battal, who is another famous commentator on Sayyid Bukhari. Uh, Say his name again. Ibn Battal. His name is, his, his proper name is Ali Ibn Khalaf. He said, Ajma'u ala anna man uqriha ala al-kufri وَاَقْتَرَ الْقَتْلَ أَنَّهُ أَعْذَمُ أَجْرًا إِنْدَ اللَّهِ مِمَّا نِقْتَرَ الْرُقْسَ There is consensus that whoever is forced into apostasy and chooses death has a greater reward than the person who takes the ruqsa, the license. So we talked about the a little bit, and now what we what we're going to hear is, is a proof that when you have an option, you're being forced to abandon your Islam, meaning death is imminent, right? Not a lot of us we scared that somebody's going to look at us funny, or we're going to get fired from the job. That, that's not death, meaning your life is in jeopardy. This is when taqiyya becomes an option. You have two options. 
stand on your dean and, and possibly die or pretend to be a non-Muslim until your life is safe again. And to die is a greater reward. That's why I said in the story of the Sahaba, Ammar and his parents, that you see both being played out. The parents didn't take the ruksa, he took the ruksa. Shehu Uthman and Fodio, Tagamadahu Lahu bi Rahmati Yami. May Allah envelop him in his mercy, he says in his book, Bayana Wujubu Hijra, books we all are familiar with, and he's quoting Imam Sayyuti and Ali ibn, Ali ibn Ibrahim al Qazim. He says, Takafu Makafata. فَلَكُمْ مُوَالَاتِهِمْ بِالْلِسَانِ دُونِ الْقَلْبِ وَهَذَا قَلْبِ إِزَّةِ الْإِسْلَامِ وَيَجْرِ فِي مَنْ هُوَ فِي بَلَدَ لَيْسَ قَوِيًّا فِيهَا وَفِي تَفْسِيرِ الْخَازِنْ وَتَقِيَّةِ لَا تَكُونَ إِلَّا مَعَ قَوْفِ الْقَتْلِ مَعَ سَلَامَةِ الْنِيَةِ ثم هذه التقية رخصة فلا صبر حتى قتل كان له بذلك أجر عظيم. He says, unless you fear them greatly, in other words, he's making commentary as well, in which case you can express friendship to them with your tongue, but not in your heart. This was the rule at a time when Islam had not yet gained strength, and it applies to a place where it may still be weak. And after a bit, according to the commentary about Qazim, taqiyya should only be practiced when one is in fear of being killed, and then with a sincere motive. Moreover, taqiyya is only a ruksa. So he's, he's saying the same thing that was mentioned in the commentary of Sayyid Bukhari. is only a license. So that if one endured until one was killed, the reward for that will be great. Alhamdulillah. Uh, no, I was reading. I, I, I was, I was thinking. <laughs> I was about to say him. But <laughs> I'm to, <laughs> she's. She said, may Allah make us stand firm, firm, firm and not take the rooks. I mean, uh, the enemies of Islam used, often use the concept of taqiyya to say that Islam allows you to lie and practice deception. <laughs> We're going to get into that. Inshallah. Uh, my first time, so that's taqiyya. That's how we understand taqiyya. But a lot of times you hear the word or concept being used is not being used that way. It's actually is usually used by non-Muslims or pseudo-Muslims, quote unquote, who are in and around Ahl Sunnah and they pretend to be Muslim. And this is where the topic gets sort of kind of touchy at. A lot of times you, you when you hear taqiyya you think of the Shia and it's really hard to talk about Shia because you have different groups and you know it's you do a disservice by just saying well the Shia believes such 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 because they all don't believe the same thing and you got very you got Shia on both extreme sides of the spectrum you got some Shiites that, you know, no, no, none of us would uh, argue that they were disbelievers. Like, uh, some of them believe that, you know, Angel Jabril went to the wrong house. He, he made a mistake. He, you know, he went, you know, he, yeah, he had no GPS. He, he didn't have Google Maps or Waze. You know, it makes no sense because the revelation that comes from the Prophet saw Allah in his house, he came to him in the cave. But you know, man, he was supposed to go to Ali. You know, he was supposed to be the Prophet. You know. They lived a life. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just like, 
I'll be like, she says, "Okay, you, yeah, I'll, it's okay. I'll, uh, it's okay. I'm okay. You can call call me what you know." <laughs> so no, I'm starting to make a list of <laughs> names. <laughs> I'll be like, uh, so some of them have the concept where their narrative is that the quote unquote Sunnis or Ahlus Sunnah Wal Jamaah is oppressive to them and will kill them for, you know, being Shiite. So, they get around us and they all hide the And then but the key is still being you. And it's being used by And this impression to a lot of us that may be right there. And I can tell you that have been right there since, since before I took Shahada in 1991. have been right there. Uh, recently, uh, and going on right now, I'll just give you a concrete example. At Howard University, Howard University uh, D.C. It's an HBCU, historically black college, university. Their MSA was taken over by the Nation of Islam. Not a violent takeover, not you no know, guns or nothing like that. By this right here, Tatiya. They got, first you have to understand, and how a university right now is in the spotlight because I don't know if you all heard about it, but uh, they're accusing people of stealing a lot of money from there. Some of the figures have been varying, but one one uh, figure is like four hundred something thousand dollars, and they have this one picture of this. The, the, this the spotlight is on one guy who was like, you know, uh, he 
they say boiling out of control basically. He had all the name brand stuff, taking pictures in Europe and all that kind of stuff. And I actually listened to an interview he did. He did an interview with Roland Martin. And uh he denies it or whatever. It, just listen to it. His argument seemed real weak. <laughs> but but uh he was basically boiling out of control. I mean and, and stuff like that. And so and that comes at a time where people a lot of students were forced to drop out of school because the financial aid office claimed that they didn't have no more funds for them. But yet certain people like him, who who was working in the financial aid office, is, you know, balling out of control, right? And getting a lot of money from the university to go to school. But he's saying that the money he was getting is not from that fund, you know, it was for this or for that, and it, you know, how a university receives a lot of money, you know, a lot of federal funds, and he was saying, well, the money he was getting wasn't federal funds, it's different endowments, and blah, 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 blah. So, how a university is already under the spotlight because of that, that, that's able, a lot of people was talking about that. Now, at the same time, there's a chaplain there who is the assistant chaplain of religious affairs, who is you know part of the nation of Islam, but she doesn't. I don't know. Somebody posted a hadith in Arabic, and they want me to stop what I'm doing and explain the authentic <laughs> hadith. Okay, whatever. <laughs> anyway, uh, so the person, so uh, this person became the chaplain of religious affairs. And she actually started bringing in Nation of Islam ministers to give the Juma Khutbah. Now, some people may say, what's the problem with that? You know, they're Muslim, we're Muslim, right? And my, my thing, my thing, our thing, our problem should be with that many fold. And when you get to these things of belief, it's never good to, you know, just label a whole group, whatever. If you talk with somebody, you should ask them specifically. But in any case, in the Nation of Islam, they publish what they believe, what they believe every week in their newspaper. For example, they say in uh they got these like these points and they say we believe <coughs> that Allah God appeared in the person of Master W. Fard Muhammad, July nineteen thirty, the long awaited Messiah of the Christians and the Mahdi of the Muslims. So they're telling you that they believe uh, Allah came in the person of a man. So they have anthropomorphic belief. You know, this should be a problem for any, any Muslim, right? I mean, this should be a problem. Allah says in the Quran, Laysa kamithlihi shay, that there is nothing like him. But they're telling you openly that they believe that Allah appeared in the person of this man in 1930. And they uh, they mix him up with the concept of the, the Messiah of the Christians and the Mahdi of the Muslim. So any person that has that belief is not a Muslim, regardless if they call themselves Muslim. Right? So you have, in that example that I'm giving you, you have people that hold that belief leading the Muslims in Jumu'ah prayer. Right. If we go back to their point number five, they don't believe in a bath. They don't believe in the resurrection. Their belief, like in this right here, is similar to like what the Quraysh believe. Like they didn't believe the Quraysh didn't believe that you know once we all dead, you know that Allah can reassemble <laughs> our bodies and our spirits and bring us back together. They say we believe in the resurrection of the dead. Not the physical resurrection. They specified it. I'm quoting. We believe in the resurrection of the dead, 
not the physical resurrection, but in mental resurrection. We believe that the so-called Negroes are most in need of mental resurrection. Therefore, they will be resurrected first. Furthermore, we believe we are the people of God's choice, as it has been written, that God will choose the rejected and the despised. We can find no other persons fitting this description in these last days more than the so-called Negroes. In America, we believe in the resurrection of the righteous. So right here, they're telling you that they do not believe in the physical resurrection, which Muslims believe in. And this is why I think it's important that these type of discussions, because you can get, go off and get real technical, but I want to try to keep it very simple. You know, when we're teaching people Islam and we're giving people shahadas, we have to be very careful. You know, we should stay rooted in the hadith of Jibril, or Jibrail. When the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was asked, an al iman inform me or tell me what is iman and he says al iman and took me na billahi well well malaikatihi wa kutubihi wa rusulihi wa yawmul akhri wa qadrihi wa khairi khair wa took me wa took me na khairihi wa sharri he said that be a belief is that you believe in allah and we have to explain what it means <laughs> you know we you know, in other words just stop there. Yeah, yeah, explain what, what what do you mean by Allah? Because I can give you a key. <laughs> like I can go to Home Depot right now. I can shoplift a key from the rack that they got sitting there and bring it. It's not going to fit in your door because the key has teeth and the teeth have to match up with the with your lock. And so we're telling people about Allah, but we haven't told them what does that mean? Allah is not like his creation, you know. Whatever you imagine, Allah is other than that. You know, we have to explain these things to him. Allah is not a spirit. He's not a ghost. You know, we have to break it down to him. Allah is not black. He's not white. He's not male. He's not female. We have to explain these things to him. Right? And angels. We have to explain to them about the belief in the angels. The belief in the books. Belief in the messengers. And with our people, we have to stop there for a long time and explain it. We have to explain what does belief in the messengers entail? What, what does that include? That includes believing and agreeing with and understanding that there's no more prophets or messengers after Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Which is another difference that we have with the nation of Islam. They believe that Elijah Muhammad was the messenger of Allah. That's what they called him, messenger of Allah. This is what, and this is not something that they gave to him after he died. This is what he, this is the title he gave to himself. Even in some of, even some of the lectures, they would have big banners. There's no God but Allah, and Muhammad is the apostle of Allah. And they were referring to him. So that, that, that part has to be, that part has to be clear. And... The, the thing about this is that you have some Muslims who know better, who got ijazat from here to the ceiling in various mutun of Akira, right? They can, they can give you Akira to Howie, they can give you, you know, Fikul Akbar. We go on for days with Akira, right? And then on the other side of his neck, tell you that. The nation of Islam, with these beliefs, they're Muslim. And you have to know, again, this is not something that is new. It's old, very old. I remember in Chester, PA, right outside of Philadelphia, right outside of Philadelphia Imam Mutawa from Cleveland was given a lecture. And he mentioned that one time in the, I forgot what year he mentioned, late 60s, early 70s, I forgot what year. He mentioned that he went and a group of other imams went to Saudi and they had, they was in these meetings. This the Saudi, the Wahhabis, right? 
before they gave themselves the name Salafi, right? They was trying to get all these African American imams to make Elijah Muhammad their Amir. Yeah, I wish I could show everybody your faces. I can make a meme out of your faces. <laughs> that don't make sense. Wait a minute. Hold up. Wait a minute. The torch bearers of Tawheed? <laughs> yes. They was trying to make... So I think this... Elijah Muhammad died in 75, right? Yeah, 75. Yeah, you know when he died. There's some people ain't going to let you forget when he died. Uh, I, I was well, I mean, he didn't die. He was right the mothership. Yeah, I forgot. The actually, I thought you were talking about Elijah Muhammad. I said, well, I don't know, but he popped up later. <laughs> Yeah, no, I think he was still alive at this time. And uh, yeah, he had to have been. And they was trying to get the Muslims, who didn't even come from that, the, the, to make Elijah, the, the uniting for under the umbrella of Elijah Muhammad. To go back even further, there was an Indian guy named Naeem, no relation. <laughs> like Uncle Rock is no relation, right? <laughs> Naive, no relation, right? When when Malcolm was kicked out and eventually broke and and started giving dawa, Naeem was the Muslim, and they was they always keep a Muslim in the pocket, a so called Muslim, even though technically he nullified his Islam, he wasn't Muslim, but they always keep a Muslim in the pocket to justify. Or, or to legitimize their Islam. So when Malcolm started giving dawah after he made his hajj and came back, this Naeem cat would write in Muhammad's speech refuting Malcolm. No, the Islam that Malcolm have ain't real Islam. The, the Islam of Elijah Muhammad is real Islam. So people that's weak and don't know what's going on, that's real confusing. Wait a minute, hold on, wait a minute, wait a minute. You mean to tell me this man who we know, Malcolm, he went over with the Arabs and made Hajj and came back and preached real Islam. And then this Indian guy who's with y'all is saying that Malcolm don't have Islam, but did he have the real Islam? <laughs> Wait a minute. It's like real confusing right there. And so you, you're going to find throughout their history that they always keep one or several so-called Muslims in the pocket to justify them and to keep other Muslims from Akhlasun and Wal Jamaat at bay when they uh, when they scrutinize their their beliefs. Uh, Farrakhan, and he's been doing this way before I even took Shahada, whenever he's speaking to a Muslim audience, he will begin the way he normally begins and he would state the Shahada and then he will emphasize, like he will say, I, I bear witness that Muhammad is a messenger of Allah. He go back and I mean Muhammad Ibn Abdullah, the son, you know, from Arabia as a messenger of Allah. And usually at that point, the Muslims in attendance, is that I go, yes, Alhamdulillah is coming around, right? So he, 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 he does the affirmation, right? But he doesn't, he doesn't reject the previous beliefs. In fact, usually what he does afterwards is that he'll come back around and go on this slight tangent about how can he deny, refuse, or reject the one who taught him, meaning Elijah Muhammad, whatever. He, if he's speaking in a Muslim audience, he won't outright say he's a messenger of Allah or the apostle of Allah. But you know, you know, he, he comes from the gratitude angle. He, he'll come from the gratitude angle, and uh, and you know, express his gratitude for teaching him and and making him who he is, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And this is nothing new. This has been happening uh, since before before I even took Shahada. So, why does why does this present a problem for someone who's Muslim? Let me ask you: Why would someone who knows the basics of Islam why would they even get caught up in this? Why would they get caught 
caught up in. Like there are a lot of Muslims who've been Muslim for a while. They're not like new shahada. It's just people that've been Muslim for a while, and it's like, wait, wait a minute, wait, you know, man, how can you say that they're not Muslim, right? Even if you spell out to them and read from their own literature what they believe, and just juxtapose it to what we believe, some of them are still like baffled, like you know, women. Man, you can't say they're not Muslim. You know, if even with those beliefs, you know, who are you to judge? How, it's, it's, it's what they want. <laughs> it's what they want. You're kind of right. I mean, I mean, it's, it, they 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 want them to be Muslim. They want to include them, or they want you know what I'm saying to have them, you know, not looked upon as non-Muslim or for for whatever reason. But I mean, it's hard to get around facts. Him said they may feel the same way they came that he came but you have to pay attention I think I know what you're trying to say I think she's trying to say that the same way that some people came come around that they, they may come around but what would the uh, but do you know the deep thing about it now not uh, they're not only learning the ones that are learning we're not talking about just the regular people on the street the ones that are learning from us among them they're using what they're learning from us against us not to correct their beliefs because in different cities you have some of us that go and teach them and try to work with them or whatever and they're sitting taking that information and alright they're sitting in class and they're using that information to refute and argue. They're twisting it and perverting it and arguing against us. And I need to pull something up because all of this is important. Give me a second. They created a monster. Who's that? The leaders and teachers who keep enabling them. Wait a minute, where are you at? I'm looking for something. Where are you at? I was trying to see it. That's what I'm doing. I kept doing it. I'll find it. In any case, while I'm looking. Let me ask you this question while I'm looking. What type of posture or position should we have towards someone who claim who claims to be a prophet? Who claims to be a prophet? Yeah. There's only one position. They, they lie. What, what do you mean what position do we... I don't get it. Now, because a lot, a lot of times with a lot of people, we, we, for example, in this issue right here, you know, everything's with a broad brush. We either take it all or we leave it all. But when it's something with our not want that's not good, good for us, we'll categorize certain things. Well, well, I'm not with that, but this other thing he came with, um, you know, I'm cool with. Well, I mean, I, I can halfway understand that, that kind of that position, being that um, <clears throat> before before I knew anything about Islam, or when I first started to kind of learn about Islam, the only thing I knew about Islam was the nation. Uh -huh. And I could agree and understand them from, say, for example, um, a political aspect or an economical aspect and you know, bringing the black man together and working together and doing stuff and building and whatnot or whatever, I couldn't understand all that, but I couldn't get with the religious portion of it. You see what I'm saying? Right. But I think as a, as a Muslim, I mean, you know, we enjoy the right, forbid the wrong. I mean, we, I mean, what's right is right, what's wrong is wrong, and we call them out on it. And if, you know, I mean, I think if, 
if we can, if there's things that we can come together socially or whatever the case may be or whatever, and work together and build and whatever, whatever, that's fine, but I don't think there should be any kind of compromise in them understanding that no, that's a lie. You know, and if you can accept me understanding that that's a lie, <laughs> then, you know, we can go forward or whatever, but I mean, there, there's no compromise on that. I'm looking for something very important. Cause like with me, I think it's it's real similar like to the to the lesbian homosexual issue or whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? What what things you do and know in Islam that's wrong. You know what I'm saying? It's haram and it is what it is. You know you can accept it, reject it, do what you want to do with it, but that's our opinion. That's what it is. Aside from that, you know. Okay, well, if you can accept that, then, okay, well, you know, whatever. That's just me. And said, the NOI is smart and they make people question Islam. Example, a friend of mine said the other day, Farrakhan said, Prophet Muhammad, real name is Kareem. I'm like, what? Don't tell me about the nation, but she actually thought she actually, the nation was one and the same. Okay. I found what I was looking for. Oh. What 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 was he posting? What was he talking about? I've left for you two things. But uh be he Wa alaikum salam, Sali. Alhamdulillah. Jersey in the building. <laughs> Y'all coming to Pittsburgh? Marhab, welcome. Come through, inshallah. Mashallah, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. The, there's one guy, just kind of like off to me, he's like a, a hodgepodge, because you got one guy, he's, he, uh, 
he's been around for a short minute, but he uh, he uh, he's gaining a lot of popularity amongst the, the regular people, the non-Muslims, because he, he did a few videos about uh, marijuana and how marijuana is being used to euthanize people, and it's uh, uh, it, it's actually uh, good information. But 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 this person, uh, he's I'm not sure if he's part of the Nation of Islam or he's affiliated with it. But oh, Wesley Muhammad. Yeah, Wesley Williams. Yeah, yeah <laughs> same he's, person. Yeah, he's yeah, he's like their Sheikh. He's like their Qadi. Well, we're academician. Yeah, he's the academician. Come on, with the big words. Come on. Yeah, he's their Sheikh. He's their Qadi. PhD in history. What were you? Academician. He's academic. Academic, academic scholar. scholar. I have this. I was trying to pull up his PA, find his PhD thesis. I have it in front of me. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to read the abstract. Chair. Uh, let me see. It's called Tajalli Warutya, a study of anthropomorphic theo theophany and Vizio D in Hebrew Bible and Quran and early Sunni Islam by W. Wesley Williams. Now I know I probably beat up that Latin. But. W. Wesley Williams? Yes. Basically, he's arguing that God can be seen and was so by Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He can be seen and what? And, and was and was seen or was saw oh, he was by, the, by the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. <clears throat> and basically, his whole argument is that God is black man. <laughs> Would that, to dispute that, would that fall into uh, black as uh, creation and God doesn't not like his creation? What do you mean, of course? <laughs> <laughs> his, his whole, Lesson Hall's purpose is to try to legitimize Elijah Muhammad. Right. And talk, put him in, in, oh. the, in the ethos of Sunni Islam. And he's trying to use like anthropomorphism, which is taken from like the Hanbalis, Ahmed the Hanbal, and stuff like that, and trying to say that here's anthropomorphism. So we're saying the same thing, so why are they out there sooner or we're not? That's basically what he's trying to he tries to do with his work. I have one of his books, it's very thorough. I mean his research is very thorough. Mm -hmm. So to refute it, you have to really be a scholar, is what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. He's very thorough in his in his, uh, his research. And he was, uh, the amazing thing about this is that he was uh, granted his PhD based upon this. And and the, on the doctoral committee is Professor Sherman A. Jackson, who was the chair, uh, Juan R. Cole, uh, Alexander D. Knish, and Professor Brian B. Schmidt. And so, uh, you know, I'm not an academic, and I, I don't even pretend to to be that. But at the very least, some people say, well, he was just doing his job. How are you going to sign off on that? I mean, I, I would have got fired that day. Or, or maybe I would have been accused of being religiously biased or something like that because I would have been going to every argument, especially somebody as much knowledge as his. I would have never signed off for a PhD like that. But in any case, who 
where we at? I was talking about the, uh, they always kept somebody in the pocket. Uh, so, and this has been, and it's still like this now. So nowadays, like, when people hear talk like this or they read something like this, you're always going to have someone who that you identify as being from Ahl Sunnah or Jamaat to stand up and defend them so they don't have to defend themselves. But again, oh, I asked you the question. I, I said, you know, how, does some, how can somebody get caught up in like this? I personally believe because a lot of us are getting caught up into this quagmire because we're thirsty. What do I mean? For example, when, when your body is thirsty, when your body needs water, for example, you're playing basketball or you're doing something, you're exerting yourself, and after the game, like somebody like me, like, depending, like, I can't drink all water. Like, some, depending on what brand of water, what, how the water tastes, I can't just, it's very hard for me. I have to force myself. But if I'm thirsty, I feel if I just finish sweating a lot or whatever, that same water that's hard for me to drink, I'll guzzle it because I'm used to, you know, because cause my body is craving for it. In the same way, human beings want to be connected with their own. And with every people on earth, there's a direct connection to Islam. Allah and his messenger in the early, early generation, right? But for us, the black people, African Americans, all of that is been erased and is being erased. And that's a whole separate lecture. I'm sure I'll be preaching to the choir if I just gave many examples of that. But, I mean, just even when you just erase the skin complexions of everyone who happens to be black or dark skinned from amongst the companions or notable scholars or first three generations, every other time their complexion is not an issue. But if they happen to be dark, then we're just going to leave that part out. Or we're going to translate it using some word that's not even in common usage anymore just to, you know, just, just to downplay the fact that these people were dark skinned or black. And, and, and so, and like I said, we preach to the choir, you, you all already know this already. Because of that, we are thirsty for something. And it's in Islam, it's already in Islam, but it's being hidden from us, it's being kept from us. One thing about the nation of Islam, one thing that their leadership has always been good with, and they're experts in this, they know the psychology of our people. They know it very well. They've even spoken about it publicly, many occasions. Even when they choose their leaders, they're careful about the complexion of the leader because they know that we black and we have a natural yearning to be connected with blackness, but they also know that we have self-hatred amongst us. Mm -hmm. So they make sure that whenever they choose their top leaders, even during Elijah Muhammad's time, that they make sure that they was light-skinned. Malcolm, Farrakhan, light-skinned. They ain't going to have no... No, the national minister, jet black. No, you can be a local local minister, but you ain't going to be over everybody. You know, uh, I'm sorry, I heard not the silence, Khalid Muhammad. Yeah. <laughs> I was about to say Khalid Muhammad. Yeah. 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 Silence, Khalid Muhammad. Uh, and so they, they, amongst black people in general, they understand and they know very well I psych our psychology and they also well aware that I've listened to several speeches they know that we are being kept from our true Islamic legacy they know Islam is being whitewashed and everything black is being erased or downplayed or covered up in Islam a lot of us don't realize it I mean everybody in this room realize it but the average Muslim don't realize that and, and so, a lot, they're using, they, they're coming at us psychologically. Like, you know, listen, you Muslim and everything, but what you doing for your people? And, they, and, and, they, and they're using that angle. 
And a lot of us feel guilty about like, man, yeah, that's right. What am I doing for my people? Right? So, you know, I need to be connected with my people. You are connected with your people, especially if, you know, if you're connected with us. I mean, you don't have to go outside of Ahlusunah wal Jamaat to quench your thirst. That's what I'm saying. But again, a lot of us don't know that, especially this latest branch or this generation of Islam because they've been given Wahhabi so-called Islam and they're at the forefront right now of making sure anything black is erased and downplayed. I mean, all of, all of their translations, I mean, they're going out on a limb. I mean, they, I mean, for example, in their translation of uh, Riyadh al-Salihin, going to the righteous by Imam al-Nawawi, you know, in the, in the very end, there's a hadith where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is reported to have prohibited pr praying with your hands on your hips. Right? You know, they retra retranslated that, you know that, right? He said, Darsal and publications, uh, translations of that said, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam prohibited you praying with your hands by your side. Mm. Hmm. You get the implications? Mm -hmm. How did clearly it says hip, right? Because the hip is by your side, so they, <laughs> you know, so they tweak that in order to get the ignorant amongst them to use that as a so-called proof against subtle or praying with your hands to the side, mm -hmm. which is done primarily by Malikis, most of whom come from Africa. <laughs> right? So, and so, and, and I mean, they've done, been doing a whole, a, a whole uh, lot of things. And so, uh, their argument against us, when I say they, meaning people who think like either they're from the nation of Islam or they think like the nation of Islam, <laughs> is that we worship the Arabs. We want to be like the, the Arabs. Mm -hmm. you know, when they talk to me, I'm like, I don't know who you talking to. You got the wrong one. <laughs> you, you must be speaking, go to the other mansion up, uh, you know, in the other neighborhood, mm -hmm. our brother's neighborhood over there. Go, go there. <laughs> you know, that, that's the ones who worship the Arabs, not us. We very aware and cognizant and woke to who we are. Mm -hmm. right? You know, you have to go to some other people for that. So, no, that's the that is the way that they come, and a lot of people are in fact nullifying their iman. People that you'd be surprised with, and the, the amazing thing about this is, and I think, I think what will help us understand how we should be thinking is that we go back to the seller, we go back to the early generation. When the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam received that that deputation from uh, uh, Bani Hanifa, you know, Musalima, mm -hmm. his tribe, when they came uh, and left, and there's a couple conflicting rewire narrations of what happened. Some people said that Musalama stayed in the tent. Some people said that he actually went there, whatever. But in any case, when the leader of Bani Hanifa died, uh, Musalama became the leader that he became to be a prophet. Then he sent this letter to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he said, uh, in this letter, uh, this letter is from Musalama, the messenger of Allah, to Muhammad, the messenger of Allah. He says, uh, uh, I, I'm a partner with you in this affair, you know, half the earth to me, half the earth to you, but, you know, the Quraysh, you know, they're kind of like insolent, they're kind of rebellious. In other words, we don't really mess with y'all like that. We know how you get down, but, you know, I'm just telling you what it is, right? And so, uh, when these two delivery boys, these two messengers brought the, that letter from Musalama, and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam read that, he, the Sahaba described him as being, they saw the anger on his face, like he didn't have, to, he didn't have to say anything. And he said, "What do you say about what he says in this letter?" These two messengers said, "We say what he says, like basically we ride with him." The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, "If it was was wasn't treachery, or if it wouldn't be considered treachery, I would kill you right here." 
for agreeing with him. But we, but we don't kill messengers. So this is what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said. This is what he said about the one who delivered the message and agreed with the message. If you wasn't messengers, I would kill you for doing this. So, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam wrote back, this letter is from Muhammad, the messenger of Allah, to Musalama, the liar. The earth belongs to Allah. And he gives it to whomsoever he pleases. All right? And he sent that letter back to Musalama. Musalama, when he received the letter, he asked the messengers, what do you think about Muhammad? So, oh, he's the messenger of Allah, etc., etc., etc. He said, what do you say about me? So, huh, we can't hear you. <laughs> uh, and then he repeated, this happened two, three, or four times. Then Musalama killed the messengers. <laughs> you know, if we get international law and respecting messengers and ambassadors, we're killing them. One of those messengers that was killed was the son of Nuseba, Ben, uh, ben Kaab. I named my daughter after her. Nuseba Ben Kaab. She was one of the uh, only women from amongst the Ansar who gave the Bayat at Aqaba. Uh, and this is why she took it personally. She actually fought in the battle during Abu Bakr's time against Musalama. But in, in any case, uh, what uh, many people don't know is that the Sahaba caught up to them two messengers later on. And uh, they asked each other, uh, the one of some said, ain't those the two messengers who delivered that letter from Musa? It's like, yeah. But you know, they, they, the prophet didn't kill them because you know, they were messengers. Yeah, so, uh, are they delivering messages message right now? <laughs> like, nope. <laughs> so, uh, and they actually killed him. They, they, they actually killed the two messages. So them two messages was actually killed later on. Was this, at, at, was this at, on, on their way back or after they had already... No, this is way after the fact. Okay. Not, it wasn't even like during the, that whole, that whole oh. thing. I mention that because the, because it shows you how the Sahaba thought about those issues. And what what I what I mentioned to you just now, you can find it uh, uh, in Imam Tahawi's uh, Shara Ma'ani Al Athar. Uh, Because it shows how the Sahaba thought about that. On top of the fact that during Abu Bakr's time, they actually fought and killed Musalama. It was a whole lot of bloodshed on both sides. It was a very rough battle. Mm -hmm. And I think anyone who wants to understand the nature of these things, you have to look at Musalama. You have to study him. There's a, there's a reason why the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was tested with him. You know, because he's our example, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So that this false prophet emerged while he was still alive, and how does how he reacted, how the Sahaba reacted to them, to, is a lesson for us. And uh, we have to also understand also that you know there's a big elephant in this room here. If the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is saying that there's no more prophets after. And this man is saying that there's a prophet after him. And there's communication going on. And it's been made clear that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Allah said so. And the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa said so. And you still saying that no, there is a prophet afterwards. The, the big elephant in the room is that you're saying that Allah and his messenger is lying. Mm -hmm. 
So for a Muslim to be like on the fence, like, huh? Well, see, I'm not. I, I don't agree with the messenger part, but he did have a good economic program. Mm. He did have a. He did organize people. No, you don't even believe that. Because if you want to go to an economic program, if that's the case, why choose someone who is a false prophet? Why not go to someone who never claimed to be a prophet? The one who he got his economic program from in the first place, Marcus Garvey. Why not go to him? I mean, literally, if you look at Marcus Garvey's parade and his marches or whatever, if you're not paying attention, you think it's the FOI doing, doing their marches and stuff. Look at look at video. You could do a Google YouTube video search of when they had their big convention in Manhattan, in Madison Square Garden. They had a big parade and all that. If you look at that, you're like, whoa. And a lot of these people were part of Garvey's movement as well. They were part of that. Michael's parents was part of Garvey's movement. I was part of Garvey's movement. So it, it's clear where these things are being borrowed from. So when, when people say things like that, they're lying to themselves. And in the in the thing about Marcus Garvey, he accommodated Muslims. He didn't say, you know, I'm Christian, so everybody got to be Christian to be down with me. You got to be Christian. The Muslims had a, a active and visible role in their movement. <clears throat> uh, editors of their newspapers, the, the the whole one one God, one aim, one destiny uh, mantra, all of that was influenced and directed by Muslims. But the other ele elephant in the room is anytime you have false prophets in Islam, you have people who, and they're clear on it, a lot of times we're not clear on it. They set themselves up to be enemies of Islam. I mean, I, for example, I'm sorry. You know, I'm yeah, sorry. <laughs> and even if we want peace, we don't want to fight. They're the ones who want the beef. They're the ones who want the drama. And a lot of times, in a lot of the, in a lot of places in the country, you don't hear about it. Especially now, people want to, because everybody wants to sing kumbaya and forget stuff. But stuff out of history. Mm -hmm. A lot of people lost their lives over this. Mm -hmm. I mean, some of these same people who, who, uh, you know, say that you know they're Muslim or whatever. These same people killed Malcolm. And I mean, you can go with the, you know, we know that other higher, pe higher up people. You know that was you know that the, the wasn't black. You know we know that they were the puppet masters, but those people who had really pulled the tri trigger, they was more than happy to pull the trigger. And Malcolm was Muslim. I mean, you can't pour gas on a fire if there's no fire. You know. Uh, also, uh, in, in in Washington D.C., uh, I think they refer to it as a Hanafi killing. You ever heard about that? There, you said no? Yeah. There was a uh, person. His name was Ernest 2X two, two McGee. McGee 2X, something like that. He was the national secretary for the Nation of Islam. This was during Marco time. And Malcolm recommended that John Ali have that post national secretary and so he was fired as the national secretary and John Ali became the national secretary and most people say John Ali was a FBI agent then some people want to get the disagreement well he wasn't actually an agent he was just a snitch the difference between a snitch and an agent whatever right he was working for them boys yeah uh <clears throat> Malcolm, one time, because Malcolm and John Ali was actually living together at one time in Queens. They shared the same house. The FBI raided them. And Malcolm made mention to several people. He said he felt that it was at that raid that they turned him. Mm -hmm. Right? But in any case, uh, uh, Ernest 2X McGee, he, uh, he uh, goes down and, you know, he becomes a Muslim. 
he gives Lou Alcinda his sh Shahada, Kareem Abdul Jabbar. And uh, they, you know, open a masjid and everything like that. He changed his name to Hamad Abdul Khalis or something like that. And he writes a letter and sends it to most, if not all, of the Nation of Islam temples making mockery of Elijah Muhammad, like inviting him to real Islam, but like real condescending, disrespectful, like, you know, because like, you know, you know, basically, basically calling to, calling him to Islam and, and, and uh, admonishing Elijah Muhammad the way we admonish our people, like, you know, just getting on it, riding on him, the jow, antichrist, whatever. I, I even think he called him a muck muck. <laughs> because you know, back in the the, 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 the Sunni Muslims at that time, because you know when when Elijah Muhammad got arrested, he said his name was Elijah Muhammad, but he couldn't even say it right. So he was like, well, name was Elijah Muk Muk. So a lot of the way they would make fun of the nation is to call them Muk Muks, right? And so I, I'm not sure. I got I got the letter on here, but I think he even called they even called him a Muk Muk. So you know, back then the nation was strong. So when that letter went around, they said, oh no, he got to go. He got to go. And so they sent a hit squad at him, and they killed most of his family, children, grandchildren, babies, like drowned them in the bathtubs and sinks and shot. I mean, they went in the house and they committed a massacre, mm -hmm. literally. And mm -hmm. but him and his one of his wives wasn't home. They was out shopping, and it was with uh, another brother. And they left their money or something back at the house. And so when they went back in the house, I think the brother were in the house and they were still in the house. They, I think they brought him in the house, killed him. And I think uh, one of his wife, one of his wives, or somebody, I'm forgetting the details, but they went to the neighbor's house, called the police. And uh, one of the brother's daughters, they shot her in the, they shot her in the head. She was in the closet, and then they, at some point, they went and shot, killed her little brother, but the girl was still alive. And when she, when she heard her little brother getting shot, she screamed. That's when they recognized that she was still alive. They went back and shot her in the head again. And uh, and Malik said the hitman crew came out of Philly, unfortunately. Yep, that's true. Uh, and one of them snitched, and they got him in prison. That's how all the details came out, mm -hmm. right? And so, and and that's we can digress. That's part of part of the problem in Philly now. Part of this because a lot of these people that's involved with that connected that they idolize that stuff. Mm -hmm. And so but that's a whole other story. Anyway, uh, so when this thing actually went to trial, she she ended up testifying. The one that got shot in the head twice. Oh, wow. She did. So, uh, so so you know, and they inside the prisons. That was a ripple effect between the nation and the Muslims. So, like, it, it wasn't this kumbaya stuff you see now. It's just that, you know, you see on our part and the nation of Islam part that a lot of us ain't built like we was back then. On both sides, you have people that was ready to live and die for their beliefs. Mm -hmm. On us, we just, you know, we, we, we all the same. We get along, whatever, like that. You know, you know, he can he can be the messenger of Allah. It's cool, whatever, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. We we say this bastard. We go over Akita of Imam Tahawi all day, <laughs> but then at the same time agree with something like that. And so I want to make it clear that I'm not advocating violence. I'm not saying we need to go back to the '70s where you know we need to go start shooting. I'm not advocating that. I'm just saying that for us Muslims, we have to be clear where we stand at as far as, you know, when, when we interact with people. Okay, we can work together on this, like you said, on this or that community project or whatever. We live in the same neighborhood. We want to keep our community clean and keep our community safe. We want to work with everybody. But now you're talking about, you know, you know, we're going to do Eid together, we're going to do Juma together, we're going to, you know, your belief is the same as mine. No. 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 We're going to invite you to Islam if you don't accept, mashallah. And, 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 I, and, I, and, I, and I really sincerely believe that a lot of us are vulnerable because we've latched on 
to this whitewashed version of Islam, which is not Islam. And that's why you see a lot of people, they go from one extreme to another. One minute they're Wahhabi, and they know something's missing. And plus the Wahhabi stuff is crumbling anyway. It's been crumbling for a long time. Because the most, you know, the, in the Wahhabi movement, all of their scholars, they get kicked off the dawah. Everybody actually graduate and finish their program, they get called deviants. So, you know, so they don't really have anybody of, of really any weight, you know, and, and all, and, and the ones that are sophisticated enough amongst them, uh, who are sharp enough, they recognize this stuff too. So, so they, so they talking like we talk, and you know, they talk about the black Sahaba and, and all of this kind of stuff too. And so, and because of that, they getting kicked off the dollar. So you have people like that who, you know, they know something's missing and then they go to this other extreme, like one of these groups, like that. And, and, and like I said, I believe it's because uh, they, in your heart, in your soul, you know something's missing. You know something's missing. You may not be able to put your finger on it. You may not know what it is, but you know something's missing. And then here's somebody come tell you that they're Muslim, and they show you all the signs and indications that they're coming over, and they they're smart enough and, and, and smooth enough and slick enough not to say that Elijah Muhammad is the messenger of Allah, or you know, or they try to get you to forget about what they their stated beliefs are that they mention every week in their papers and on their website whatever, you might lower the wing to that and you may think, you know, okay, we together, he's making salat like me, he's learning Arabic like me, you know, he's learning, he know how to say inshallah, he know how to say mashallah and all that. They're, playing, they're doing taqiyya. Because some of them, the same ones who learn Arabic and all that, you catch them amongst themselves, they make a mockery of you telling you that, you know, you worship the Arabs and, you know, we follow no Arab prophet, you know, our prophet came to us, you know, and all this, this is where they talk. And so, and I'm, I'm talking from communicating with people who know. They're doing taqiyya. Amongst us, they, 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 you know, they learn from the best who've been doing it for a long time. You know, they'll say what they think we hear amongst us. And uh, then amongst themselves, their beliefs are, are the same. And my argument is, why go through all that? If you really believe what you, what you believe, why? What's the purpose of getting around us and pretending you don't that you believe something that you don't believe? Unless your intention is to either get us to you know slow walk us and convert us to what you believe, or that you try to destroy our belief. Mm -hmm. You know, so it is 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 that that's very important. And that that whole situation at, at Howard University, I hope, is being dealt with. But you know, the the whole culture at Howard University. You know, everyone that's been there says the same thing. People that 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 that, that go there now, that's from there, uh, and that, in, the, in other words, uh, Howard University is that alma mater. They all tell you the same thing. It's like this fast fashionista, fast fashionista type of culture. Like everything is fashion. And like a brother, he he told me go to the, go to the MSA's website. Oh, he told me you know, he you know, he jabbed this, and you know, this is like it's fashion night, and everything is fashion, mm -hmm. right? You know, so it's all about like, and I'm and I'm mentioning that because, like, the MSA there may not be like other MSAs where they got active learning programs and all that kind of stuff. It, it, it's just like it's like it's like a bourgeois contest. Mm -hmm. Like you know, you go into an HBCU, a lot, a lot, most of you there get some type of you know financial assistance. How can you be con more concerned about fashion? Mm -hmm. Like, where's your priority? And so, you know, you know, from what was told to me, like, basically, when you got men growing up, coming up in an environment like that, a lot of the brothers, they, you know, they kind of emasculated. Mm -hmm. You know, they're not going to, like, no, whole way, but we ain't going for that. They got, like, this older sister who's, like, uh, a chaplain over them and dictating, dictating how things should go. And they just kind of, like, asleep at the wheel. And, they, you know, they, they kind of let that happen. Mm -hmm. So you got, you know, emasculated men letting an undercover NOI operative, you know, gut their MSA from the inside out. And so, and this happened in a lot of places. They're making overtures 
to various various Muslim communities, not just on a college campus, individual communities. And they're coming with this, oh, we want to do Eid. We not only fast in December, we fast in Ramadan. And we make it Salat. We want to do Juma. You know, we have Juma too, in all these places. And and a lot of us are like, oh, yeah, all right, yeah, that's good. Yeah, let's do it. No. Let's talk about this Akita first. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times we don't want to offend anybody, but no, hey, we can, we can have a discussion and be respectful. What do you say about point number five and not about not believing in the resurrection? Mm -hmm. And you, I don't know what they will say in a person to person conversation like that, if they will hold to it or if they say they don't deny it. Because I know, I know if it come to me, I'm going to say, all right, then, well, you, how are you still going to be part of an organization that proclaims this, but you yourself don't proclaim that? So that means you're not part of the nation of Islam no more, right? You don't believe in point number five about the resurrection not being physical. It's only uh, mental or spiritual. And you don't believe in point number 12 about Allah appearing in the person of Master Farah Muhammad anymore. And that's your organization's belief. How can you, how can you still say you're part of that organization? Was Mary a virgin? Huh? Was it was Miriam a virgin? Oh, they they got a problem with that too. Oh yeah, they, do. they probably got that from uh, <laughs> Kadiani, probably, right? So I mean, unless the Nation of Islam got like a a, a section where you can be a member but not a believer, <laughs> I don't know. A lot of organizations have that. Like you know, you could be a supporter but you don't necessarily have to believe in everything they can believe. I don't know if the nation is set up like that. Mm -hmm. Alhamdulillah. So the, the main point that I, w I wanted to talk about the Qiyya and how it was, uh, how we understand it, how it's practiced and how it's used. And we also wanted to discuss how it's being used on us. It's like being inverted and used on us. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and it's happening. It's, it's, it's happening live in real time. It's being televised too. And, and so I, I've said what I've said, and a lot, a lot of people who are experienced and know what I'm talking about, they might say, well, you said, you know, some imams are down. Well, name the imams. I'm not naming no imams. You, you take what I've just said to your basic principles and apply it. If that imam right there is saying that these people are Muslims, even though they say they still believe that he nullified his Islam, and that applies to whoever imam it is. Whether he's popular or not. You can't believe two things. That Elijah Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. Or the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the messenger of Allah. You can't believe both. Because the messenger of Allah says that Allah sent you as a prophet. And, and Allah spoke to you directly by means of Angel Jibril. And if you believe that the, uh, uh, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the messenger of Allah, you also believe that Allah himself said, as well as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, that there's no messenger after me. You can't believe both. Which one do you believe? You have, you have to pick. And again, we're not trying to... I mean, we're not encouraging anybody to be hostile or disrespectful or argumentative or not even not or not violent. Just you have to be clear on where you stand, and when you interact with them, invite them to what is what is true. Bring them to, bring them the proofs. Go back to the Quran. You have to go back to the Quran. The Quran makes it clear, and just to give you further insight, according to many researchers. Farah Muhammad himself was a Qadiyani. Mm. Right. And if this is the case, it makes sense why all of the so-called recommended literature that he left for Elijah Muhammad was a lot, a lot of it was Qadiyani. Like even the Quran that they, the translation of the Quran that they use is Qadiyani, Muhammad Ali uh, translation, which I think was even before Yusuf Ali's translation. I think Muhammad <laughs> Ali's translation came out first, I think. And so, and it, if you can understand their connection to the Qadianis, they call themselves Ahmadiyyas, we call them Qadiani, right? Uh, uh, if you understand their connection to the Qadianis, and you also have a little bit insight on how they tinker and play with the word Qatim or Qatim, you know, the seal or the final prophethood. They got a whole, you know, 
one thing that I think I don't think a lot of us appreciate is pseudo Islamic groups or whatever. Their founders are not stupid. A lot of times they're some sharp cats. Mm -hmm. You know, a dummy can't come up with a whole religious belief, and you know it takes somebody that's intelligent to do that. And so don't think that because you know because we look at in hindsight these things have been argued about and refuted already by our scholars. So we come behind later like yo, how can anybody believe that? Well, this is stupid, right? No, it, it, these guys thought these things out very well. And so alhamdulillah, I'm not gonna hold you anymore. Uh, any any questions from uh, Facebook Live or here or any comments? Anybody online, we, I'm going to wait to see if y'all have any comments or questions before we log out. I don't know, whoever, some of you may have logged in late. We talked about taqiyya or dissimulation in Islam, which is when a Muslim is being faced or threatened with death and being forced to abandon his religion or abandon his deen. We talked about what what it means that it's a it's a ruksa, meaning it's a license to do so, meaning you won't get blamed by Allah for doing so, meaning if somebody's threatening to kill you because of your Islam, and you can pretend to be a non-Muslim to save your life, that is permissible. But it's the higher and better role and greater reward by holding on to your Islam. And then we went from there and we talked about how <clears throat> other people invert it and pretend uh, to be Muslim <clears throat> when they are in fact non-Muslim. And some of you may say, oh, you can't make talk fair. No, I'm, I'm t what I'm talking about is ma'loom, is known of the deen by necessity. Yeah, I mean, if you say that that uh, Allah came in a person of somebody, you're not Muslim. If uh, your wife said, "Is that at gunpoint or verbal threat?" <laughs> You've been married to your husband too long with some questions. <laughs> now, uh, if you perceive it to be a threat to your life, may, maybe somebody just verbally threatened you, but there's a gun nearby. <laughs> you know, you know, if you if you perceive that, listen, if if I hold on to my Islam, I'm going to die. That, that, that's how you take that. Then it's a ruksa. Right. Then you take that. Um, question. Um, as I mentioned before, how um, some enemies of Islam will use that concept and say that, well, Islam teaches that it's okay to lie. It's okay to deceive. Right? <laughs> what are the parameters, so to speak, of well, that that's it. The, the parameters, that's basic, the, that's basically, basically, your your life is threatened. Uh, deception and lying. What those other people saying? Those are all uh, characteristics of munafikin hypocrites. When he speaks, he lies. When you trust him, you, when he has amina, kinda, he's treacherous. He's deceptive. Like right? the opposite of being trustworthy. And so th those are all characteristics of, of, of hypocrites. And usually whenever you talk about uh, hypocrites, the first characteristic about them is lying. They're liars, they're treacherous. And so those are ve very bad uh, character traits. And in Islam, there are very few circumstances where you can lie and be treacherous, like uh, at war. And you know, you know how we do. We got some people be like, you know, well, we at war right now, and, and he's talking about another Muslim, right? And so, and so, so you know, it's deception and war. So you know, and this is a type of war. And so you know, and, and you know, you find people flipping stuff. You know, uh, people got enough good game. They'll flip it and have you using concepts that's meant for non-Muslims, having you use it against other Muslims. You know, and that's one of them. War is deception. Uh, 
if someone, if you want to make peace between two Muslim uh, brothers that's maybe beefing, you know, again, even in this situation, you know, two Muslim brothers is beefing. If you can tell the truth and bring them together, you don't just jump to the lie, right? <laughs> if, you know, well, maybe, you know, it's just all bad. Next time I see that big guy, I'm going to kill him, right? Maybe we're like, why, why you say that, man? That brother loved you. He was just upset, man. I'm like, oh, word? Yeah, yeah he, he just telling me that a few minutes ago, right? Even though he just said the same thing. Next time I see him, I'm kidding, all right? <laughs> then you go to the other one real quick. Like, no, I was just talking to him. You ask him, I was just talking to him. And he said, I mean, he was just upset. He, yeah, he said it, but he was upset. He loved you, man. Right. Oh, word? Yeah, I was upset, too. <laughs> Right, you know, you lie. That's that's a lie. That's an ex that's excuse. And under that category is also when a, when a, a person tells to his wife, your wife spent all this time breaking her back, cooking this food. That thing is nasty. Right? How it tastes? Mashallah is excellent. <laughs> maybe maybe your wife, if you tell her that it ain't good, maybe it just might crush her. Or maybe you might have have a type of wife. Or you might get crushed. Yeah. <laughs> or, or you might have the type of wife that that'll be like, you know, well, I ain't really like it all that. So I oh, look good. See, next time I cook for your black man. <laughs> right. So maybe she she's cool. You're, right. But the wife, they might just mess her up, and I mean, she, you know, she go into a depression because you ain't like it. No, don't, don't tell her that. You be like, you know, no, mashallah, this man, Allah bless you for it. You know, you don't like because a lot of times we like black and white. So. Okay, I can lie. So, you know, yeah, the food was excellent. It was scrumptious. And, oh, man, if you can just cook this all the time. And you know what? Matter of fact, while I'm lying about this, let me lie about a few more things, right? <laughs> this is how we go. No, like, the, when, when you look at the, the, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Sahaba, the way they lied, a lot of times it wouldn't actually be a lie. It would be a vague statement that you can take two ways. Like when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was making uh, hijrah. You know, they was trying to catch him. And he was with Abu Bakr, and they bumped into somebody. And, uh, uh, no, I'm confusing two things. Uh, it was one of the battles. Well, in any case, they ran into to an Arab who was from someplace. And they asked and, and they asked him for the location of the Quraysh. And, uh, and they made like an agreement, like, you know, I give you information, you give me information. And so, long story short, they asked the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he asked the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam where he was from, and he said, Min Ma, uh, from water, right? And so, and then the Prophet just left, he just walked away. Mm -hmm. He was like, like, which water? He started naming all these bottles, <laughs> bodies of water, and he, he wasn't lying, you know, Allah says he created every living thing from water. Mm -hmm. So, it was a vague statement. Us, we try to, okay, we can lie in this circumstance, so I'm going to use this, and I'm going to try the biggest, boldest lie. No, you try to stay as close to the truth as possible, mm -hmm. you know, without lying. Let's see. Uh-huh. Um, you're saying that there are people that are, like, sort of, I guess, justifying what the nation is on, teaches, things like that. You're talking about common folk, you're talking about leadership, or just in general? I should have clarified that. I mean both, but you have some some leaders who are trying to work with the leadership in the nation of Islam for whatever reason. Allah knows what's in their heart. Uh, and then you have then but I was most of my talk I was talking about common people who May not be leaders, but you know, they well grounded in Islam. They they know they know the articles of faith. They know, and a lot of them are what we would call quote unquote traditional Muslims. They're not you know like La Mathabi or no non Tariqa or not like that. They very clear. You know they you know they some of them are very studious, but in spite of that, some of some of them, you know, when it comes to the nation of Islam and, and their beliefs, you know. They, they don't get it that part, but you know. Uh, for so for the most part, that's what I was talking about. Hold on, let me see this. Uh oh, what I do? 
said brothers and she has said brothers and sisters get to the point you are making mis you are making misconstrued with hypocrisy it was told that when you're when your life is threatened take it from us we do not stress. okay I guess he's admonishing you Hassanali. no he said, <laughs> no, he said I think he said they get the point okay We here in Pittsburgh. Okay. Oh, you answered them already. Okay. I'm late. I'm late. I'm all late. You already answered it. Hey, you didn't turn your camera around, Chuck. I got to turn it around. Yeah, turn it around. What happened? I'm looking at myself on your joint. Oh, my bad. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking at you too. I'm like, well, I have a problem. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Uh, Alhamdulillah. 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 You know, so, Sultan Muhammad is from here next weekend. Not this coming, I think the next weekend. You know who Sultan Muhammad is? Thanks for this now? Yeah, he's like their imam. He's the one that's been like teaching, like, yeah. Sunni Islam. He's going to be here. It's going to be a CEA, I think. It's going to be a banquet Saturday. Hmm. On a Saturday. I don't election. know how I missed that. I think they're on Juma Friday, then it's going to be something on Saturday, the banquet, and then Sunday is going to be a talk. So that's not this weekend, the next weekend, I believe. What are they doing Juma? I don't know. Like, maybe at their spot, I'm not, I'm not sure. Maybe a CEA. I know. I think the banquet is at CEA. Okay. Maybe Juma is too, I'm not sure. Hmm. But I got an invite for it. I didn't invite him to like, read all of it. But Brother Jason called me as well and invited me to come. I would like to know how they make all that mesh. You know? Well, I think they, um, you know, they, they're, I guess, trying to align themselves with the general Muslim population of the world. Mm -hmm. So they're taking on things, you know, because like, like the fast in December, they stopped, I think, in the early 90s. They stopped mm -hmm. doing that. They still do it in prison for some reason. Yeah. <laughs> but, so they're trying to align themselves with the greater Muslim community by doing things like instituting Jumu'ah. Mm -hmm. And some of them, like you said, years ago were praying, you know, doing Salat and stuff like that. Yeah. But I guess more institutionalizing their organization, like doing Jumu'ah, fasting Ramadan, and things like that to make those connections, but still hang on to, you know. But they don't deal with the belief issues? Not, I've never heard of them talk about that. Mm -hmm. but well, I'm just gonna go because I would like to meet him and talk to him if I can. Yeah. But, oh, well, Mal Malik did say he had a question. I don't know if that's the question he wanted, but he said he had a question for you before he closed out earlier on. He said, yeah, he said, are there any groups from among the Shia that we would consider Muslims who don't have gross beliefs? I can't answer that question. Because I know there's some, I know there's some groups who a lot of people are now are including among Ahlus Sunnah wal Jamaa. Which which groups are those? It's slipping my mind. That's not that that some some of our modern day scholars are now including under the umbrella of uh, Ahlus Sunnah wal Jamaa. The Jafarid camps, or I think so, Jafarid. What do they believe? I, don't know, I, I, was, I think I was told that I think they're like the most similar or closest or something like that. Exactly where the split is and the difference is. Yeah, I know a lot of people are referring to them as like the fifth meth had and all of that. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. I don't know. I used to know the different groups and all that stuff, but it's been so long since I got into their history and their beliefs that I can't really answer that question right now. Malik said, what about the Zaydis? Any, um, any of y'all know about the Zaydis? I got other things you to study. And <laughs> <laughs> said, question today at my job, a lady said the greetings. I said it back. But well, what baffled me was she said, what do you believe? I told her she, I told her, she said she believed in Ali, which I know is Shiite. Do we treat them as Muslims? Me, I usually treat them as Muslims until 
or unless I get something specific, like whatever. So I, I, I assume, I assume that they're Muslims, because some people, some of them claim that they only prefer Ali, but they don't have a problem with Abu Bakr. They don't make takfir on him or what, or what have you. Uh, Allah knows best. And in this area, you got a lot of them. And in Pittsburgh, you got a lot of them. They kind of like intermingle with some of the quote unquote immigrant masters, but I think they've just gotten permission to open up their own master, and I think it's in Monroeville. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was always um, kind of under an assumption, you know what I'm saying, that, say, for example, if an individual comes, whatever, and it comes out that they're Shia, yeah. okay, well, they're Shia, they're Shia, okay, whatever. Now, once you open your mouth and start, you know yeah. what I'm saying, start expressing some of that stuff, okay, in, yeah. until then, we ain't got no problem. Yeah. You know what I'm saying, I don't want to just jump and just um, say, okay, well, because you're Shia, you believe Abu Bakr, you believe that, you know what I'm saying, you right. believe all the stuff or whatever. Okay, well, you know, that's what it is. It is what it is, but until you show something outwardly yeah. that kind of goes against whatever, okay, yeah, we'd be cool, whatever, but, you know, understand that you want a tight rope with that. You yeah. have to. <laughs> like if I get in a discussion with him, it's, once it's clear that <laughs> Shia, I'm at, what, what you think about Ali? Oh, you need was it police? <coughs> oh, you don't believe you should have been a prophet, right? <laughs> no, okay, okay, okay. You got that extreme group out the way. What about well, well, I'm like, what about Aisha and Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman? What about them? But yeah. funny story in um, in Seattle, a long time ago, at a party named Sufi, yeah. and uh, they got this annual thing called Bumper Shoot, and we was going there to give some dawah sell some incense and whatnot or whatever. On the way there, <coughs> you want to stop by, uh, there's a, like a military surplus yeah. place or whatever. And we went there and uh, come to find out it was it was owned by some Jews. Right. And he had a real thick accent, right? And um, he was uh, looking different stuff or whatever. And he said, uh, he seen this one knife or whatever that he liked or whatever. He's like, well, let, let me see that knife, right? And uh, I mean, we were dressed obviously, mostly. and so the lady behind the counter, this Jewish accent or whatever, was like, uh -huh. "Oh, you know, good, good, good Muslims don't need those, right?" Uh -huh. And he looked at her. He said, "What well, makes you think we're good Muslims, <laughs> right?" And was like, "Come on, let's stay." Anyway, we left there. It was time to mix a lot. Down the street, there was this Persian. I think it was a Persian restaurant or something like that. We figured Persian, Muslim, okay, we went in there, maybe they got a place for us to mix a lot. Yeah. So we go inside or whatever, and they got these like little statue things up or whatever, got a dance floor, <laughs> you know, whatever. So we like, oh, well, anyway, we went to play, hey, you got a place where we can mix a lot, mm -hmm. right? And um, so we ended up making a lot on the dance floor, hardly wasn't anybody there. Yeah. Um, so on the way out, he was like, uh, he was like, yeah, man, this little Shia spot, da 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 da, whatever. Like, I didn't know much about anything. So um, some people had, uh, <laughs> that came in and uh, gave me greetings or whatever. They said, oh, you know, I so He said, uh, what's your name? He said, Abu Bakr, right? <laughs> and the guy looked at me, he's like, what's your name? I said, Umar. <laughs> <laughs> and then we ended up leaving, but I thought that was, I don't know, I thought it was funny. Maybe it shouldn't happen. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Did somebody ask a question about what is a salaf? Did somebody ask that a while ago? Okay. Anyway, mashallah. No more questions. Any more? Any more questions from Facebook Live? Yeah, yeah. Can you can you explain what is a salaf? Sayyid Abdul Hakim before. What is a salaf? That's a, a class. Well, that's a class by itself. How should I answer that? Which door should I walk in? The, the short one. The short one. Okay, so they all got to be short. short. But there's some, there's some, someone from amongst the Salaf, right? Okay, next question. A Salafi <laughs> is, a, is a perversion of the, uh, the, the Salaf without the Iya or the Yi going to the end of it. The Salaf refers to the first three generations of Muslims. The Sahaba, the Tabi'een, and the Tabi Tabi'een collectively referred to as the Salaf of Saleh, the righteous predecessors or ancestors. There's a group 
who recently came about. They're a new group, newly invented matter, who re, uh, gave themselves the title as Salafia or Salafi for short, Dawah to Salafia or Salafi for short. Uh, that was new. Uh, before that, they didn't really give themselves any name. Uh, they were called by their opponents uh, Wahhabis or Wahhabiya, meaning the, the followers or the adherents to the doctrine of Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab of Arabia. Uh, according to some reports, it was shortly before the death of Sheikh Nasruddin al Abani who encouraged them to give themselves the title of Salafi. And he got that by reading some old works of Muhammad Abdu, Jamal al-Din Afghani, and Rashid Ridda. And that's where he got the idea from. Uh, they were the first, those three people, if you study uh, 18th, 19th century uh, Islamic world, Egypt, and all that kind of stuff, they uh, they were a group of Freemason Western uh, agents working to undermine Islam, and they had a big impact on Islam, uh, even still today. Even the fact that some of you insist on calling yourself Salafi comes from these guys, these Freemasons. Even though you you Salafis would d definitely disagree with them as far as methodology and all of that. The name, getting the name Salafi and ascribing it to yourself was never done in history until Muhammad Abdul's time. Muhammad Abdul. So it's a bit of? Yeah, yeah it's an innovation. Allah says in the Quran, Hu as samakumu muslimina me kablu wa fi It is he, Allah, or Ibrahim, depending on which uh, tafsir you go with, that named you Muslim from before and in this, meaning the Quran. So the name that Allah gave us is Muslim. But that group uh, of people, they call, they insist on calling themselves Salafi. And again, they got it from Nasruddin al-Bani, who got it from somebody he wouldn't agree with himself, but uh, Muhammad Abdul. You know, Muhammad, A-B-D-U-H. Look him up. And what was his whole thing is that Islam has gotten old, it's antiquated, it's not keeping up with modern times. We just need to stick to the Quran and the Sunnah uh, and according to the way of the Salaf. And so when, when somebody tells you that, what they're telling you is that I'm going to interpret it for you. We're going to skip all these generations. We're going to skip the whole Islam. We're going to skip every link between us and the Salaf. And I'm going to take you directly to the salah. That's what Ab Muhammad Abdul meant. And uh, so uh, he took it from them. And from this day, they've been running with it. And as time goes by, people who call them, who affiliate themselves with the so-called Salafi Dawah or what have you, they got really elaborate things. And they're basically trying to tell you that Sunni equals Salafi. It's the same thing, right? Uh, and one and one of them tried to, uh, a few of them tried to refute me, and I mentioned this before, and you know, they, they went to Lisano Auto, and they went to many different classical uh, works, because I mentioned this, and they tried to say I was ignorant, didn't know what I was talking about, and they just went everywhere where the word Salaf is mentioned. Mm -hmm. Nobody's arguing that point. I mean, we can find the word Salaf in some of our supplications. In the du'a for the Janazah prayer, the, sal the word salaf is there. Nobody's arguing that. But taking that as a concept and applying it to your movement or your group. And Sheikh Ramadan Bhutti said it best. And he wrote a book, at least one book, more than one book, with almost similar titles. That, that uh, He said that uh, Salafi is a blessed time period, not a, me not a menhaj. He said, Salafia, Zamana Mubarakan, La Menhajan. A blessed time period, not a methodology. So they made it a methodology. It's a time period, the first three generations. And so 
you know, nowadays because it's been around so long, and the people who was qualified to openly deal with <clears throat> to my people here in the Arab world, they've been refuted. But here in America, you know, the, the people who was prominent at the time they first got out, they was more concerned about being politically correct, so they didn't really deal with them. They dealt with them in closed circles and they little halakas and stuff, but they didn't deal with them openly. So now, to a lot of people, Sunnah equals Salafi. It's a difference. It's a big difference. And then a lot of them, some the, the more knowledgeable ones among them, a lot of them are ascribing to methads now. You know, so, so some of them, you know, claim to follow the Hanbali method. You know, I question that, but that's another story. And some of them uh, claim other methods, and they claim to be Athari and Akita. There's another back door. You know, now we're not Asha'ira, we're not Maturidiya, but you know, we Athari. That's another Akita discussion. But anyway, uh, they say, you know, we don't do top wheel and all that. Well, it's not, yeah, the Sahaba didn't do top wheel, but you no, know, the Sahaba did do top wheel, but that, you know, <laughs> another thing. So, so I hope I answered the question. What is Salafi? So uh, um, actually, the Kutba, I mean the Juma, this Friday, inshallah, I should be in Newark, New Jersey for the Juma Kutba. It was in that masjid that I first learned what a Salafi was. <laughs> Long time ago. Anyway, no more comments, no more questions. Inshallah, subhanakallahu wa bihamdika, and inshallah, wa inna ila ila anta, wa staqfaluku wa tubu ilayk. Uh, I pray that uh, what I intended to achieve by addressing this topic was achieved. My intent was not to uh, vilify or to gas anybody up to do something rash or violent. That wasn't my intention. My intention is to, my intention was to get the Muslims to pay attention to what they're doing and what they're co-signing. So I hope that uh, my intention was achieved. Uh,